Uh, so maybe we should just about get started. So today we're very happy to have Graham Siegel joining us from Oxford and Cambridge uh, remotely uh, under current circumstances. And his topic you can see here is work rotation and the positivity of energy in quantum field theory. Well, it's very nice to be uh, here, albeit remotely. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about what is actually not altogether completely recent work with Maxim Konsevich, which has been going on for rather a long period, but which now at least we have a written down version of. So <clears throat> let me begin right from the beginning. In ordinary quantum mechanics, the states of a system are represented by the rays in a complex Hilbert space. And it, it, in some sense, this talk is about the role of the complex numbers in quantum mechanics. Actually, I, I remember when I was quite young, I visited the IHS and got into a conversation with René Tom at T about quantum theory. And he said, well, the basic mystery is why the complex numbers come in because they have no role in classical mechanics. And I was very, felt very honored to be talking to him, but I, being a young person then I thought, well, that's the kind of thing old people say. And now I'm much older than Tom was then, and I'm saying that. <clears throat> we have the time evolution of our system given by one parameter unitary group, and that's generated by a software joint operator of course, the Hamiltonian. And um, positivity of energy is <clears throat> the fact that this sulfur joint operator is positive. So you can say that in terms of its expectation values in various states, or you can say that you can look at its spectral decomposition and the spectrum is in the positive half line. Well, <clears throat> you can also, however, say it in a holomorphic way because to say that that operator is positive is obviously the same that the is saying that the evolution operator is a boundary value of a holomorphic function in the upper half plane. You can define it for any t time t in the upper half plane, and you'll get not only a holomorphic function, but a bounded holomorphic function of t, a bounded operator valued function of t. And that's clearly equivalent to the operator, the Hamiltonian operator being positive. There's a very strong constraint on the evolution. It tells you that if nothing's happened in the last 10 minutes, it's not going to happen at all. And at all. I find that quite comforting, actually. No pandemics, for example. It is really a very strong constraint when one thinks about it. Uh, anyway, we have this relation then between the unitary group we started off with and a semi-group parameterized by the imaginary axis, so to speak, in the time plane, which is a contraction, a semi-group of contraction operators. And these two things obviously define each other. And the passage from one to the other is roughly speaking what's called wick rotation. Well, the aim of this talk is to produce an analog of that correspondence in quantum field theory, quantum field theory being a version of quantum mechanics in which the observables are localized in space as well as in time. So somehow the opposite of a pandemic which reduces space time to one dimension. So we sit in front of our laptops. So we're trying to understand how energy is somehow local. And the standard way of approaching that is in terms of the Whiteman axioms, which expressed in terms of local field operators and vacuum expectation values. Uh, right at the end, if I have time, I'm going to come back to that briefly, just to say one, make one short mark about it. But uh, in a rival axiomatization, where we replace the homomorphism from time to unitary operators of ordinary quantum mechanics with a functor 
which associates an operator to every space-time manifold, which is cut off in the past and in the future by space-like hypersurfaces. So we think of this as being something like a generalization. We think of these Ms as being something like a generalization of times. And I think of them as a semi-groupoid under the operation of concatenation. Now, a semi-groupoid is what is nowadays called a category, but it's perhaps worth pointing out the word at this point, because when you, most people know what a group is nowadays, a semi-group is got from a group by relaxing the axiom that everything has to have an inverse. So we drop that, and the oid says that we generalize the concept in another way too. We allow there to be more objects, that the group element, so to speak, can be maps from something to something else, but although possibly also maps from something to itself. So we generalize or weaken the notion of a group in two ways, given by the semi and the oid, and that gives us a category. And I want to think of a quantum field theory as a representation of a category. The advantage of this way of looking at it is meant to be that it's a kind of one-stop shop uh, in that we, well, we make the requirement that the functor takes disjoint unions to tensor products, but we don't need to make any explicit mention of field operators, locality, commutation rules, and that kind of thing. They're all meant to arise out of the basic formalism of this representation. I'll just some, say one word about that, about how field operators and locality emerge. When you have a space-time M and you have some little region U in it, then you can think of the M with U cut out of it as being a manifold whose incoming boundary is the original incoming boundary as well as the boundary of U, and its outgoing boundary is still the old outgoing boundary sigma one. So because of our tensoring axiom, that gives us a map like this. And so if we take any vector psi in the vector space associated to the boundary of U, which is an object of our category, then that will give us an operator from the incoming space associated to sigma one to the outgoing space sigma one from sigma the space for sigma naught to the space for sigma one and that's the analog of the field operator localized in u of course there's all kind of discussion about taking a limit as u becomes very small and that sort of thing i won't go into that in this talk so i want to think of passing from quantum mechanics to quantum field theory as in terms of this picture that we're <clears throat> instead of replacing the time axis by a time upper half plane, we want to replace the category of Lorentzian manifolds under concatenation with, on the one hand, the category of Riemannian ones, which are going to correspond to the imaginary time axis, the positive imaginary time axis, and a new kind of structure, manifolds with complex metrics, which uh, I'll just refer to as allowable manifolds. So the aim of the talk really is to introduce a notion of a complex metric on a smooth manifold and uh, to make a certain amount of propaganda for it. So this category of manifolds with allowable metrics, it's going to be a complexification of the category of, uh, of the category of Riemannian manifolds, just as the upper half plane is a complexification of the imaginary positive imaginary axis. And the Lorentzian cobordism category is going to lie on the boundary of this category. And it's going to be what's called the Shiloff boundary. I'll say a few words in a moment about what a Shiloff boundary is for a complex domain for those who don't know about it. Um, so let's, uh, yes, I'll say just one thing before I go to the definition. Inside the Lorentzian 
category, of the category of Lorentzian space-time. There's a subcategory of ones called globally hyperbolic ones. I'll, I'll say something about what they are later. And essentially, they're the ones that are groupoids and are going to be represented that form a groupoid. They're going to be somehow invertible and they're going to be represented by unitary operators. There'll be other ones with more complicated structure, which I wouldn't expect to be represented by unitary operators. Again, I'll come, come on to that later on. So the general phenomenon that I <coughs> am describing is that when you have a complex semigroup, and I'm going to give a variety of examples later on, uh, it often has a, a part of its boundary called the Shiloff boundary, which we can single out, and which contains an open subset, which is a subgroup. And holomorphic contraction representations of the complex semigroup are going to have boundary values, which will be unitary representations of the group, which is the open subset of the boundary, and behave in a extend in a more complicated way to the non-good, uh, so to speak, elements of the boundary. So now I come to the definition of a complex metric. So it's just going to be an ordinary Riemannian metric on the is given by saying that on each tangent space, we have a positive definite inner product. Well, we're going to assume a, a complex metric will be something which gives us a <clears throat> symmetric real bilinear form, but complex valued on each tangent space. So on a real vector space, we're going to consider, I should have said symmetric here, I've left out the word. We're going to consider complex valued inner products on real vector spaces. And we're going to ask for a positivity condition. I'll come to the exact positivity condition in a moment, but it's going to have the following property, just to start off. Uh, when we <clears throat> pair an element with itself, when we look, so to speak, at the length squared of a vector, that's going to be a complex number, which will not be allowed because of the positivity condition to lie on the negative real axis. So that means it will have a well-defined square root, which is in the right half plane. And so every tangent vector is going to have a length, which is in the positive, in the right half plane. Well, uh, the first condition that I guessed when I started thinking about this was to add to the an ordinary Riemannian metric an imaginary part which was positive definite. That isn't going to be the right definition quite. It's on the right track. The motivation for that is that if one is interested, say, in a Gaussian integral like the one I've written here, where A is a real symmetric matrix, but not necessarily positive definite, then that integral with an i in the exponent doesn't converge, of course, it's not a convergent integral. But if you move A so that it is a complex symmetric matrix and you make its imaginary part positive definite, then <clears throat> of course the integral converges and then you can move, so you have a holomorphic function of A defined in the complex domain of symmetric matrices with positive definite imaginary part. That's called the Ziegel generalized upper half plane. And that holomorphic function has a boundary value, which you take to be the value of this Gaussian integral when A is a real symmetric matrix. Well, in uh, the boundary of this Ziegel domain is a bit more interesting than it looks. You might, it's just like some sphere. That's not true, and we'll come back to that later. But anyway, that isn't quite the domain we want. So let's uh, go on a little bit. Uh, actually, I think I'll put in at this point the concept of a Shiloff boundary all the same. Uh, the domain we're talking about, Ziegel generalized upper half plane, that's an open set in a complex manifold. And you can think of it 
is having a closure inside the compact manifold in the same way that the ordinary upper half plane you can think of as the as a disk, an open set contained in the Riemann sphere. Uh, in the case of the Shilov domain, we can do exactly the same transformation and think of the things as symmetric matrices with operator norm less than one by exactly the same transformation whereby we get from the upper half plane to the unit disk. So I want to be able to think of, imagine this thing as having some closure, which is a compact subset of a larger complex manifold. In that situation, we can look for a part of the boundary, which so to speak dominates the behavior of holomorphic functions in the domain. So this is an analog for complex domains and holomorphic functions of the idea of extremal points of a convex set in Euclidean space. If you have, for instance, an open simplex, it has a certain number of vertices and the behavior of linear functions on the simplex is completely determined by the value on that finite set of vertices of the simplex. Similarly, the Shilov boundary of <coughs> the kind of complex domain we're considering there'll be a compact subset of the boundary such that the norm of the function of a holomorphic function in the interior of the domain, if it's bounded at all, is dominated by the value of the norm, the, the supremum of the norm on this part of the boundary. So let me give you first the two most obvious examples. First of all, a polydisc disc in complex space where you take all the coordinates to have norm less than one. So just a product of N standard open unit disks. <clears throat> then the boundary of course, would be a manifold with angular with, with corners and so on, which is of dimension two N minus one, but the smallest stratum on the boundary is N dimensional. It's the region where all the coordinates said have absolute value one. That's an ordinary n-dimensional torus. So its real dimension is half the real dimension of the domain. And that is the Shilov boundary of this domain, the polydisc. And of course, just using Cauchy's theorem, we see that whenever we have a holomorphic function in U, which is bounded, then its values inside U are completely dominated by its values on this torus, which sits on the boundary. Well, a little bit more relevant to what we're talking about is that there's a non-abelian analog of the polydisc. If you consider all N by N complex matrices, which have operator norm less than one, then on the boundary of that sits the unitary group. That consists of complex matrices which have operator norm exactly equal to one. But of course, its real dimension is just half the real dimension of the domain of complex matrices. But we have exactly the same property. This is a Shilov boundary. The, in all these examples, the domains have stratified boundaries. That's very obvious in the case of the polydisc. In the case of these matrices, the relevant stratification, you see, is the number of eigenvalues of this matrix, which have modulus exactly equal to one. So the smallest layer is when they all have modulus equal to one, and then you'll have a unitary matrix. So the Shilov boundary is the smallest stratum on this angular boundary. Uh, I'll come to the slightly more interesting case of the Shilov boundary of the Ziegler upper half plane a bit later on. But now let's come to the closer to the actual definition that I want for the domain of manifolds. If we think of a scalar field, say massless, for example, then it has its action, which we're going to use in, its, in a path integral given by this expression, where this of course means the 
inverse matrix to the Riemannian, the, the matrix describing the Riemannian matrix. Well, if we want that to be something which has positive definite real part, the natural thing to look for is that this matrix, this being the matrix G inverse, and this being the volume element, is to ask for the, the, the real part of that should be a positive definite matrix. That's equivalent to saying the same thing about the inverse matrix. Uh, so it's equivalent to saying that this matrix, not quite the Riemannian, complexified Riemannian in a product itself, but you divide it by the square root of the determinant, that that should be in this generalized Ziegel domain. So that's a condition we want on our bilinear forms, on our inner products. But we want more than that because, sorry, am I? For some mysterious reason, why? Oh, sorry, for some, for, wouldn't move for a moment. <clears throat> well, so we want to consider not just scalar fields, but other fields potentially too. If we want to consider electromagnetism, then we're immediately led to the two form action like this. And it turns out to be expedient to include just two form actions like this, but all P field actions where you have a closed P form on your manifold. And uh, Edward pointed out to me that he and Weinberg wrote an interesting paper on why the class of fields of this kind are special with respect to the definition of an energy momentum tensor, uh, tensor for the field. And that's in this now rather old paper. Uh, anyway, considering these kinds of fields motivates the following definition, that a complex metric on a real vector space is a <clears throat> bilinear form with the property that the real part of not just of the quadratic form itself, but of all these quadratic forms you get on the exterior powers are positive for all values of P. But bear in mind that, that the value, if you have an inner product G, even complex valued, it will give you a star operator, a Hodge star on the exterior, the complex exterior algebra, because G is complex valued. So this thing alpha wedge star alpha will lie in the top exterior power complexified. So it will be a complex top degree form on V, so a complex volume element. And it makes sense to say that its real part is positive. And that's the condition that I have here. If we look at this condition when P is equal to one, then that will be exactly the condition I had before, not saying that the real part of G is positive definite, but the real part of G divided by the square root of its determinant is positive. So that incorporates exactly what I was just asking for. Well, that was the first way I thought about the condition. Uh, and I told it to Maxime, in fact, I even gave a lecture which he came to in it. And he pointed out that he had already thought out that there's a, a different condition, which at first neither of us thought of as equivalent, which is much, much more explicit. That's just a condition on a complex valued in a product that you can find a basis for the real vector space which diagonalizes it such that when you diagonalize it, the diagonal elements, if you look at their arguments, their angles, the angles add up to less than pi. Now, of course, when you have a complex symmetric matrix, then in general, you can't even diagonalize it at all with respect to a real basis. You can, for instance, if the real part of the matrix, it's equivalent to diagonalizing simultaneously two real symmetric forms. And you learn 
as an undergraduate that you can do that if one of the forms is positive definite. In this case, neither the real nor the imaginary part is positive definite, but this condition certainly tells you that a linear combination of them is. So you do expect to be able to diagonalize it with respect to a real basis. And then there's this condition. And it's then quite an easy piece of linear algebra, which I don't propose to do now, uh, to see that these two ways of defining a positivity condition on a complex valued in a product are exactly equivalent. So I'm not going to go through that argument, but you can look at it on our preprint if you like. Uh, Graham, could I ask a question? Yeah. Um, this is Greg. Um, so if I think about a one-dimensional topological field theory, then that's, the data for that is, is a vector space with a, a symmetric non-degenerate form. Uh, right? Well, a one-dimensional topological field theory. And a one-dimensional topological it has to have a uh, not even right. Well, it, it, has has to have, it has to have a product as well. Uh, so the data isn't just uh, no, no, uh, one dimensional, not two. Sorry, one dimensional, zero oh, space. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So, sorry, sorry. Okay, zero ahead. space in one time. So it's just a vector space, which is the functor applied to a point, and yeah. then I have to, and then there has to be a symmetric non-degenerate form. Uh, and my question was, um, as you just pointed out, if we're working, if the ground field is C, uh, it's not necessarily diagonalizable. But I was wondering if, if there's anything one can see intrinsically in the topological quantum field theory that uh, singles out your metrics. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> sorry, that question taken me by surprise. Uh, uh, okay, never mind. Never mind. Please uh, I go mean, this, uh, this, 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 so the theory in particular would have to be semi simple. And uh, uh, of course, uh, lots of. Well, yeah, sorry, the question taken me by surprise. So I, I don't know what, what to say. Okay, about. never mind. Never mind. Um, let, let me discuss an aspect of this um, in the one-dimensional case, in fact, but not, not in the direction <laughs> you were just asking. Uh, because I want, because you see, we're going to say that an allowable manifold is going to be one which is like a Riemannian manifold, but on each tangent space, we have one of these complex valued inner products. Now, a Riemannian interval is determined by its, of course, up to isomorphism of Riemannian manifolds, because you can always parameterize the interval by arc length. That's far from true, obviously, if the metric is complex. Uh, because an allowable interval, well, you have this metric. Uh, the metric is just a one by one matrix. and what it will reduce to is just saying that this thing lies in the, um, the, the length squared of every vector will be a complex number, which is not on the negative axis, negative real axis. So instead of the analog of parameterizing it by arc length would be to embed the interval in the complex plane by solving this differential equation, which evidently you can do. And that means that the metric is pulled back then from the obvious complex metric on the complex numbers. So uh, here we've embedded some interval like this, but of course we can say that the metric then has a certain complex length, which is this complex number this is the interval embedded in the complex numbers. And the, if we start off at the origin, then there we have its length. But we can get to this point in lots of ways. So there are lots of quite different uh, complex metrics which will have the same complex length. 
In fact, the only restriction on these curves is that they always have to move steadily from left to right. They can't go backwards this way, but they can go up or down at their leisure. So we have these things, but the remarkable fact, which is absolutely, in, in some senses, probably the most important sentence in this talk, is that if we have a holomorphic function of such a metric, which is invariant under reparameterization. So in other words, if we have a holomorphic function of an allowable interval, then the value of the holomorphic function only depends on this single complex number, the complex length. And the principle that comes from is just simply that when you have a Lie algebra acting by holomorphic vector fields on a complex manifold, you might say acting holomorphically, but that's perhaps a little bit ambiguous, then a holomorphic function, which is invariant under the Lie algebra, has to be invariant under the complexification of the Lie algebra. If we had a group acting, it would also, that it was invariant under, it would have to be invariant under the complexification of the group. And anyone who's read any uh, sort of classic quantum field theory will know that applying that when to, to the Lorentz group or to the Poincaré group is one of the basic steps in quantum field theory. You say that things which are expectation values which are invariant under the uh, Poincaré group have to be invariant also under the complexified Poincaré group. And that's kind of the starting point of uh, a great deal standard work in quantum field theory. I'll return briefly to that way of looking at it, but at the moment, uh, let's just go back to our diagram. You see, suppose we have a function of this curve, which is invariant under reparameterizing the curve. That means it's invariant under the diffeomorphisms of this interval. Uh, the group of diffeomorphisms of the interval doesn't have a complexification, but it's Lie algebra is the vector fields along the interval. They can certainly be complexified. When you complexify a vector field, it will no longer point along the interval. So it will correspond to moving the embedding of the interval inside the complex numbers. And so if a thing is holo depends holomorphically on the interval, it will be invariant under moving by a holomorphic vector field and then little by little, we can get from say this embedding of the interval to that embedding of the interval. And that is the, gets us from one complex, one allowable interval to another. As I said, that's probably the most important step in this talk. And uh, it tells us in the one dimensional case that a holomorphic representation of the semi-group of allowable intervals is just the same as a representation of the complex semi-group with which I began the talk. But the important thing is that this is an argument which works in all dimensions, or at least it almost does. You see, what it really crucially depended on was moving the interval inside the complex numbers. The complex numbers were actually a complexification of the interval. And in order to be able to perform this argument of moving a little bit, we need to be able to put our original Lorentzian interval, which lay along the axis, remember, be able to put it a little bit inside some complex chain. So we need to classify our Lorentz borders a little bit. The only way Maxim and I could do is to assume the Lorentzian cobordisms were real analytic. Now I, that's an ugly assumption and I don't think it's really necessary but we haven't really pursued the point very deeply and it doesn't really interact any particular way with anything I'm going to say in the rest of this talk. So I won't say any more now. So let's go
one. Uh, let me point out just one fact about Lorenzo's Romanian cordism. Even in an undimensional case, you see, the argument I've just given tells you how Lorentzian cobordisms can in some sense be invertible. You see, uh, I've now, this diagram, I've now rotated because remember, I'm now thinking <laughs> it, my definition of complex in a, uh, products made the Romanian ones be the real ones. So going along the real axis. So this diagram is rotated through 90 degrees from the one that I started off with and the Romanian manifolds would go along this way. So if we have a Lorentzian interval, it goes up like this along the axis to here. If we have, if we deform it a little bit to an allowable metric, it goes up very close to the complex metric, to, to the complex imaginary axis. <coughs> but we can now do it backwards and come down like this. And we now have a very long cobordism which goes up and comes down. But if we have something that depends holomorphically on the concatenation of these two things, then we can contract this down to a little tiny, very short cobordism along there, a very short Romanian cobordism that will be represented by something very close to the identity as we make this shorter and shorter. And that is why this will, we will get something invertible when we pass to the axis. You see, it wasn't at all obvious that if we had a semi-group parametrized by the half plane, that it should be invertible on the axis. But this holomorphic holomorphicity property is what saves us in the situation that we're considering. Uh, well, you you class... to... Sorry, did someone you ask? You want it to be unitary, not just invertible. Uh, yeah, yes, I wanted, uh, and I, I did, don't want to, yes, in order for it to be unitary, not just invertible, I should say a little bit more. I want the, uh, I want the cobordisms to depend on the metric in such a way that when you change the metric to its complex conjugation, to its complex conjugate, and simultaneously change the time orientation of the cobordism, change the orientation of the cobordism, that, uh, that induces the adjoint operator. That requires a little bit of spelling out. That's the condition which is in field theory usually called reflection positivity. And I, I haven't written it down here, so I'll refer to the preprint where it's kind of explained at possibly too much length. But uh, I don't think there's anything very deep involved there, except to say that the cobordism should depend in a rather natural way in, in the metric G, such that passing to the complex conjugate of that corresponds to doing the corresponding thing to the operator. Thanks. Uh, let me say quickly what happens in two-dimensional space-time. Uh, an ordinary Riemannian metric, of course, defines a conformal structure. So it do, and in order to get a complex structure from that, you need to choose an orientation to decide that multiplication by square root of minus one rotates one way rather than the other. So a Riemannian metric defines two complex conjugate complex structures. If you spell out what a allowable complex metric comes to in the case of a surface. It consists of two complex structures and the constraint on them is that they induce opposite orientations. So if they're complex conjugate, we have an ordinary Riemannian metric. And what we're doing then is letting the, as it were, taking two copies of the Riemannian metric, thinking of them as, have, as independent and allowing them to vary independently. So we're, as it were, complexifying in the most obvious way, the space of Riemannian metrics. That ref, these two complex structures just refer to the conformal structure. So in addition, a complex allowable metric consists of these two opposite conformal structures with orientations together with a complex volume element. Now, 
a conformal structure you can think of as a system of ellipses, if you like, in a complex vector space, uh, telling you how to rotate in it. Uh, so on the boundary of conformal structures in two dimensions, you have simply a foliation by lines. And so at the boundary of the, mod the moduli space of two dimensional complex allowable metrics, we have surfaces which have two foliations, which of course are simply the foliations by left and right moving light lines on a Lorentzian surface. So that fits in exactly with what we are familiar with in two-dimensional field theory, especially conformal field theory. I'd like to mention very quickly some facts about representations of groups which lie on the boundary of complex semigroups. So, so Graham, I have, a, I have a question about what you just said. Uh, yeah, um, sure. If I consider a pair of pants, yeah, then, then there'll be a, a point where the foliation, the, the transverse foliations break down and they look yes. like a, a, a triangle. Yes, so um, that will not have... Is that allowed or not? Uh, well, it will not be an allowable complex metric. So this will be a case when the, as it were, uh, the, the good subgroup of the boundary is, is, will be empty. I mean, there'll be no, there'll be no um, metrics of the good kind that we, I mean, there will be a boundary still to the moduli space, but it won't have this nice part of its shield off boundary that will give us a unitary operator. It pretty obviously isn't going to give us a unitary operator. Okay, thank you. Um, so let, let's just consider some examples of groups on the boundary of complex semigroups. The archetypal and the simplest example is the group of real Möbius transformations. So think of the Möbius transformations of the Riemann sphere. They're, they're the ones that preserve the real axis. Think of that as a, the equatorial circle. We're interested in ones then which map the upper half plane to itself. So this group of real Möbius transformations obviously lies on the boundary of the semigroup of all Möbius transformations which map the upper half plane into a disk completely contained in the upper half plane. So that's a contraction semigroup. It arises quite a lot in sturm liouville theory, for instance, of uh, real ordinary differential equations they have um, propagation functions that lie in this group. Uh, so the group is an open solid torus because you have the factorization, uh, such a matrix can be written as a positive definite thing times a rotation. Uh, so that's an open domain which lies on the boundary of the complex, uh, clearly lies on the boundary of the these contraction complex operators. To close this, it will be natural to add the two torus of rank one matrices. Of course, they don't give you well-defined Möbius transformations. A real rank one matrix, you should think of as a degenerate Möbius transformation. It has, it determines two points, its kernel and its image, which are lines in the two-dimensional vector space, the complex numbers, two real lines. And the Möbius transformation is a degenerate thing which collapses, it isn't defined at the point P, and it collapses everything which is not P to Q. So the shear off boundary of the complex semigroup, which I just described, is the real Möbius transformations together with these degenerate elements which form a complex, the, a closed solid torus uh, when you put these things in. Notice that the composition law nearly but not quite extends to the boundary. Uh, if you try to compose two of these collapsing things, then it's if you collapse everything except P to Q, and then you want to do another similar thing, it's not so good if the point Q is the one point where the next one isn't defined, then you won't be able to compose them at all. 
So things go wrong with the composition law on the boundary. Now that's reflected in the representation of the group. This group has two kinds of irreducible representations. That's not quite true. There's some other ones called the complementary series, which are not so important and which I'm leaving out here. One kind of representation is typified by action just on the L2 functions on the projective line on which we have the Mobius transformations acting should really be the L2 half densities we're talking about. There's a unitary representation on that and on any other kind of densities whose real part densities where the density has real part equal to half. They're called the principal series. But there's another series called the discrete series, which the typical member is the action on holomorphic one forms on the disk. That has an inner product like this, and you get a unitary representation on those. They form part of the discrete series. It's obvious that the discrete series extends to this semigroup, because if you embed the disk inside itself, you can pull back anything holomorphic on the disk. But it's pretty obvious that there's no way you could extend the principal series. Uh, well, the contraction representation, uh, they certainly extend to the boundary. But what happens to the boundary of the, well, the Mobius transformations themselves, of course, extend, we said. But what about these rank one projections? Well, you can pretty, uh, what, what about, sorry, these degenerate ones? Well, they're rather obviously represented in the discrete series representation by rank one projections. So the unitary representation of SL2R does extend somehow to the whole sheet off boundary, but not by unitary operators. I've often wondered whether this is relevant to quantum field theory. I mean, it's the issue over which Stephen Hawking lost money, I know. Uh, I'll come back to it a little bit more explicitly in a second. But after all, it's a reflection of the following fact. We started off with the one parameter semigroup of quantum mechanics, ordinary quantum mechanics, parametrized by real time, where the real time axis, its Shelov boundary is the circle where you allow t equals infinity as a value. And you know that this unitary semigroup isn't unitary at the point at infinity, it becomes projection onto the ground states of the Hamiltonian. And that's exactly like what happens here but in a simpler case. Uh, let me very quickly give a slightly larger but still finite dimensional example of the symplectic group of a real symplectic vector space. Think of this as the phase space of some finite dimensional quantum system, finite number of degrees of freedom. The upper half plane, the role is taken by the Ziegel upper half plane I've already mentioned, but it's more intrinsic to describe that is the positive Lagrangian subspaces of the complexification of this. You think of an, if this has dimension, real dimension 2n, you can think of an n by n complex matrix as a graph of a map from the uh, q coordinates to the p coordinates, so to speak, in v. And so that gives you, its graph is a positive Lagrangian subgroup of the complexification of V. And that's another description of the Ziegel upper half plane, which makes clear that the symplectic group acts on it. And we have something exactly like the contraction semigroup before, because we can look at the complex symplectic matrices, which map this Z half plane into its own interior. And in fact, this is something which, as a complex manifold, is simply the Ziegel domain of V, the direct sum of V together with V with its symplectic form multiplied by minus one. So it's itself a Ziegel domain, this semigroup. You can think of it exactly as like the semigroup we were talking about before. In fact, the metaplectic representation, which is a discrete representation, actually only a representation of the double covering, but that's irrelevant for the moment. That acts on the symplectic representation, the quantization of V, uh, admittedly projectively. That's an example 
of a discrete series representation. And clearly the metaplectic representation for the usual reason is a boundary value of a holomorphic representation of this semigroup. Uh, I should just mention that this semigroup was much studied by Roger Howe a long time ago. He called it the oscillator semigroup and described in great explicit detail its action on the quantum Hilbert space. Uh, the, one thing I'll just point out here is we have this symplectic group sitting on its Shilov boundary. Here, the, 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 the closure, so to speak, of the symplectic group in the Shilov boundary is less obvious. What, the complete Shilov boundary is the Lagrangian of all, sorry, is the Grassmannian of all Lagrangian, real Lagrangian subspaces of, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, the Shilov boundary of this semigroup is the Grassmannian of all Lagrangian subgroups of V plus V with its uh, form multiplied by minus one. Uh, such an L generically is a graph of a symplectic transformation from V to V. I say generically, that means if it's transversal to both axes of this decomposition. But in general, this group, the symplectic group gets compactified by adding the graphs which are not transversal to the two copies of V. They're the contact transformations which are not elements of V and they act as projection operators in the metaplectic representation. Uh, in fact, improper projection operators in that they project onto subspaces which maybe only lie in the completion of the Hilbert space, as it were. Things like delta functions along some subspace of the functions on which this is the L2 functions. Anyway, that's, that was all studied in tremendous detail by Roger Howe long ago. But it's, this is a, not, a very good example of an open subgroup of the symplectic transformation. And of course, there's a lot of discussion in the language of symplectic geometry. What are good ways of making the degenerate uh, symplectic transformations into some kind of algebraic structure? Well, the other example that I'll give, I, I don't have too much more to say, uh, is the another generalization of the Mobius transformations is the group of orientation preserving transformations of the circle. Like the diffeomorphism of the interval, that's a Lie group with no complexification, uh, but the Lie group contains a, a cone of inward pointing elements which correspond to a semigroup of annuli. And long ago, both Maxime and I discussed this semigroup and its representation theory when we first started to study conformal field theory in the 1980s. So I won't say any more about that now. There's a semigroup of annuli, which acts as a, a semigroup, which has the diffeomorphisms of the circle on its boundary. And uh, it has a class of unitary representations. I think my contribution to the subject, they were always called lowest weight representations until in my book with Presley on loop groups, I made a big play to call them positive energy representations. And I hope that name at least is stuck. Anyway, they're boundary values of contraction representations of the semigroup A. And that fits in well with the, um, foliation to which we had in uh, Lorentzian structures on an annulus, of course. Uh, but uh, so the last thing I want to talk about is global hyperbolicity. Uh, suppose we were considering two-dimensional field theory and we're interested in Lorentzian cobordisms. Well, of course, I was already asked the question, supposing this thing is a pair of pants, uh, 
and doesn't have any Lorentzian structure at all, at least not one which is uh, rather natural looking near the boundary circles. Well, uh, you might expect that such a cobordism, as I was suggested by the diagram I showed you a long time ago, consists of light lines which emanate from one, the entry circle and wind around and finally come out at the other end. And that will give you a diffeomorphism from this circle to this circle. And the light lines moving the other way will give you a diffeomorphism, another diffeomorphism. And of course, conformal structures, which are good in that sense, are completely parametrized by giving the two diffeomorphisms together with the number of times the light lines wind around, cross each other when getting from one end to the other. So we have an open sub semigroup of diffeomorphisms which look good. But of course, a foliation needn't be so good because it can degenerate or become bad by having the light lines that come out from this all become tangent to a circle which goes round the cobordism, the manifold, halfway along, so that none of these light lines will ever get to the other end. And but light lines which are tangent to it will get to the other end. Now, if you think of this conformally, it's rather natural to collapse the actual bad circle that they're all tangent to to a point. And then this is really like two discs stuck together at, two, at their center points. So if you think of this in terms of conformal structures, it's like a boundary of the conformal structures on an annulus where you get to where the annulus degenerates to a pair of disks. Anyway, you have this, these things which are in the um, boundary, in the Shiloh boundary of the uh, semi-group of annuli, and they don't get represented unitarily. In the positive energy representations of loop groups, they again get represented by projection operators. So things which, uh, if you think of this as being something like a black hole in space time, it doesn't seem to be natural from this point of view to represent it by a unitary operator. It's something which is a, a limit of unitary operators, which converges uniformly on compact subsets of the Hilbert space, but it's not, the, the unitary operators are not closed in that topology. Uh, well, I'm now going to end my two minutes more, so I'm going to end by completely changing topics. Uh, so I said Maxime and I worked on this in the 1980s in the two-dimensional case, and about 20 years ago I went and gave a talk at the IHS in which I said, uh, I, I, I gave my thoughts on exp it, extending the theory to higher dimensions, which were in a rather incomplete state. Maxime was in the audience and told me his definition of a complex, uh, an allowable complex structure. I was sort of mortified because I thought he'd thought about it a lot more carefully than I had, which was certainly true. But anyway, we had a chat afterwards and he agreed that I should write the subject up for us jointly. And with my usual haste, I got down to that and had a pretty much finished manuscript just at the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, just when I was in Paris discussing this version with him, it occurred to me to ask him, what on earth made you think of the your definition of the allowable metrics, which was the one in terms of the sum of the arguments of the eigenvalues being less than pi. What brought that into your head? And he explained to me something that I had, hadn't been thinking about at all, that he had been thinking in terms of the Whiteman axioms and vacuum expectation values and how they can be extended. So, uh, it's very well known that the positivity of energy is described by extending the vacuum, saying that the vacuum expectation values are boundary values of some subset 
which is the of the complexified Minkowski space, which you have something called the permuted extended tube, which I won't try to explain at the moment. But anything which extends to that extends to a potentially larger set, which is its holomorphic envelope. Anyway, there's a region to which these Whiteman vacuum expectation values can be extended. And there's a famous classical theorem that if you take a Euclidean subspace of complexified Minkowski space, for example, you think of the complexified Minkowski space as a standard complexification of Minkowski space, and you just rotate the time axis to make it have a positive metric instead of a negative metric. You just multiply the time axis by I, then the space of distinct catapults, all distinct catapults in that Euclidean subspace is always completely contained in this domain to which the <clears throat> vacuum in which the vacuum expectation values are holomorphic functions. So Maxim's approach to the subject had been to ask for which real linear subspaces of complex Minkowski space does that remain true? And uh, he had a, he realized that the natural condition was the one which is the theorem I gave right at the beginning, the equivalent version of the definition of allowable. And he arrived at that because an allowable metric when you diagonalize it is one where the, uh, well, well I, I won't try to explain it now. It becomes something about um, what, what you need is a theorem about extending holomorphic uh, holomorphic functions to larger domains. There's something called the uh, there's something called the tube theorem, which uh, I went, which Maxim rather brilliantly found a generalization of. He had he had used heuristically a version of it slightly truer, slightly more general than is known to be true, which experts told him could easily be proved. Just before the pandemic, we asked them all and none of them gave us a proof, but said they were sure it could be done. And in a couple of hours, Maxime wrote down a proof for me of this generalization of the tube theorem and proved this theorem, which justified his original insight that this was a good definition of allowable metric, uh, which we had meanwhile found to be equivalent with the other, to the other definition. Anyway, I've gone over time now, so I'll stop. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Graham. So we have time for questions now, but I'll ask a question first. What would be the prospects of showing that your axiom set implies the Whiteman axioms? So, or, sorry, I didn't hear that, did you say? Uh, how far afield are we from being able to prove that your axioms imply the Whiteman axioms? Oh or possibly are equivalent, but at least uh, <clears throat> if one believes that you, your formulation might be more fundamental, a way of testing that would be to show that they imply other axioms. Um, I think I'd like notice of that question. Um, we, uh, uh, I think that I think the problem comes with the definition of the field operators. You see, the definition I gave uh, potentially defined the field operators. Well, it defined observables localizable in a neighborhood U. Yes. Now, if you take a point, you can consider a sequence of little regions around shrinking yeah. to that point. Right. So that will give you by taking the inverse limit of the uh, observables in the region, uh, it will give you a notion of a field operator localized at a point. Yes. And that will be some fresh air space of operators. But uh, if you wanna actually prove anything about them, you need that limit 
to have some reasonable behavior. And it seems to me that there's no real substitute that to include some condition which I think of as a sort of a condition a little bit like asymptotic freedom, that as you, that your operators, when you look at the cobordisms which are given by the annuli surrounding one point, very small annuli, that the operators associated to those annuli mm. uh, have a kind of conformal limit, that when you scale the metric on them conformally, the things are somehow stable under that operation, that they begin somehow to commute with scaling the metric. So you want an asymptotic conformal invariance at short distances or uh, something close at, to that? At least, at least in that, at least for that class of operators coming that you get from small annuli. Yes. I think if you put that in, then I think there'd be a very good chance that it implies the Whiteman axioms. Oh, I think that would be pretty interesting to understand. Uh, a problem like what you're saying is natural in the sense that all conventional field theories satisfy it. Uh, well, well, uh, Maxime, for instance, uh, what one, one, <laughs> what one thing that always got us slightly deadlocked in our discussion is Maxime is much more Platonist in some way than I am. For example, he rather likes considering the sigma model with target a circle in space-time dimensions greater than two. So this is where, of course, you absolutely don't have that kind of yes. local behavior. The, you don't even, you can't even, you see, you don't even have the Whiteman axiom that the vacuum expectation values are distributions. They'd be some kind of hyperfunctions, which were only parable with real analytic functions. Or, I mean, I don't. To explain uh, that for the other physicists, uh, you, what you're saying is that above two space-time dimensions, the operator e to the i phi, where phi is a scalar field, is a very bad. Yeah, yeah. To consider. Yes, they, they have really bad. Uh, I'd wager if you took a vote of the physicists on this call, you'd get an overwhelming majority. To... Sorry, I can't can't hear. I think if we took a vote of the physicists on this call, we get a thumping majority in favor of assuming an axiom of asymptotic conformal invariance, something close to asymptotic conformal invariance or asymptotic freedom as a good condition to add to your axioms. Well, if I'm bound by a sort of cabinet solidarity with my colleague. <laughs> he, he likes to, he, he, he will tell you all kinds of interesting field theories that don't have that property. But of course, I, I didn't ever think about them. I, I'm the kind of person that never really got much beyond free field theories or maybe, you know, a little bit of gauge theories. Well, a different question would be to ask, what's the prospect to put free field theory in your framework? Uh, yes, no, I, I do claim that's okay. Yeah, but I, I owe you a manuscript. <laughs> well, we'd love to see that manuscript. But anyway, yes. I've asked enough questions and we'll have an extended discussion period later. So let me ask if there are questions from other people. Yeah, I, if I may, I would like to extend the previous question to all sorts of other field theories that are potentially tricky. For example, a free scalar field theory with a non-compact target space, or a U1 gauge theory where the gauge group is actually R rather than U1. Um, These are free well, theories, so there should be easier yes. to address. Uh, yeah, yes, so try, try, I'll try to answer that. And I, I can't give you a very good answer, but my the, the kind of answer, uh, well, well um, yeah, 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 so, so sorry, I, I may be confusing compactness in the target and in the space time. You asked about the target. That's correct, yeah. Uh, um, uh, in the target, uh, I don't 
believe there's a problem in principle in the target. I think, um, I mean, one has to do it, but I don't think there's anything wrong with the formalism. The, the thing that I was more interested in myself, uh, you, you see, supposing we were really hoping that this, that to have something interesting to say about black holes, then the first thing that you'd want to get rid of, I think, I mean, if you want to consider an ordinary black hole, is the compact, spatially compact space times, the compact spatial slices that I assumed everywhere, uh, which prevent a lot of things from happening. And that I have thought about. And my feeling is that uh, the right way to think about it is that one always should think of these theories as defined on the same, as cobord on cobordism categories of surface of, of where the objects are spatial manifolds, co-dimension one manifolds with boundary, which I think of as potentially quite small regions but I have in mind a boundary condition to put on the boundaries, which one's going to keep fixed. That would be choosing a vacuum for the theory in the usual language, I think, of quantum field theory. So you fix a vacuum, which you're going to put attached to your boundaries. And the way I would think of that is saying that particular choice gives us, instead of just a category of Hilbert spaces, which we're going to use as the thing our field theory takes its values in, uh, it will be some category of spaces which come equipped with an action of some type three von Neumann algebra, which is all the fields which are just out of sight, which you just see in this very blurred way. And that what you retain, the, vacu the, the boundary condition is what you retain from that sort of blurred behavior beyond the horizon. Uh, but that's another thing which I certainly haven't succeeded in working out. Uh, and in any case, it's not quite an answer to the question you asked, but an answer to another question. So I think I can't say any more about it at the moment. Uh, do we have other questions? Um, so in that case, we'll thank Graham again, and uh, those of you who want to continue the discussion have the link for a separate discussion that we'll resume in, let's say, seven minutes from now. So let's just thank Graham again for the time.